Let's look at our lesson today from Matthew chapter 16. Let us stand to our feet as we reverence God's word together. Rickabees verses 13 through 20. I want to emphasize verses 17, 18, and 19. You found his amen. This is as it reads, and Jesus responded, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed be, cause flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. Look at your neighbor and say to them, bind it. Amen. Amen. Shake their hand as you take your seat and say, bind it. Amen. 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 Bind it. God gives everyone the authority to make choices. It's a powerful privilege to be given to human beings is that we have free will. We have the ability to choose. And sometimes we think also by not choosing that we are not choosing, but not choosing is also a choice. Authority is defined as meaning rightful, actual, and in unimpeded power to act or possess control, use or dispose of for something or somebody. In other words, when you have the authority, that means you have the approved right to act and to choose. It doesn't have to be passed through committee. It does not have to have a motion and a second motion in order for you to have the authority to do something. That means that you already have the right to approve, to act. The authority to make choices gives us also a sense of accountability and responsibility. Some people would rather defer to someone else to make the choice. And sometimes it is unfair for us to criticize people in leadership because of the choices that are made because we are not often privy to all the information that is available to the leader when the decision is made. Many times we are looking from our own finite perspective into an infinite opportunity of decisions. Every day, human beings are bombarded with choices. There are over thousands of choices that we have to make every day. And according to a theory called choice theory, by William Glasser, choice is a process of our total behavior. The first thing he says is doing. These are the things such as walking and talking. We do these things by habit. The way that we talk and the way that we walk, uh, many of us have a little swag to our walk. That's just uh, the way we do things. Many of us have uh, a little bit of flavor or color when we are talking. Uh, some people who are uh, from the north and move south say that we talk different than the south. We have a little southern twain. This is just the way we do things. And ways of thinking is a second way of choosing. This is our sense of reasoning. Many people have heard the story of the man that tried to get his friend to stop drinking. And so what he did is he took a shot glass and he took a, a worm and he took a, a bottle of liquor. He poured it in the shot glass and he dropped the worm inside the glass of liquor. And the worm swam around for a little bit and it sank to the bottom. And he said to his friend, did you get the point? And the friend said, if I drank a lot of liquor, I I won't get worms. <laughs> Then of us, our thinking is different. It's not all the same because we all have different minds and our processing of reasoning is different because we all are different people. Feeling is a third aspect of choosing. Many people make choices based on their emotions. Uh, all it takes is the one person to make somebody mad. And here we are making a bad choice. Many people have made a bad choices all the way to a jail cell or all the way to a drug house or to a, a place where they feel that they are all alone because their emotions are leading them. They're not leading with their minds. They're leading with their feelings. Anger Depression often lead people to make bad decisions. Fourthly, it's our physical 
being, our, our physiology, the things uh, that actually lead us to make uh, certain choices because perhaps the heat uh, on Friday or Saturday, they even had moved some of the high school football games uh, back one hour because of the 99 degree weather uh, at 7 o'clock in the evening uh, on a Friday afternoon. They said it was too hot to play football at 7, so some people played at 8 and that feeling of physiological response of sweating and headaches uh, responding to the heat index lead some people to make certain choices. The goal of making good choices is to move from what's called codependency to interdependency. Uh, codependency is when you always defer to a third party to make the decisions for you. Uh, for some people that's some type of, of addiction uh, or some type of, 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 of a thing that's a vice that's controlling uh, your decision making. For some people uh, it's drugs. For some people it's a particular sexual addiction. Whatever it may be, you are codependent upon that thing. In order to have the decision made, you have to defer to whatever the thing is that's controlling you. Uh, somebody ought to say amen. Uh, but when you are interdependent, that means that even though other factors uh, may come to play when a decision uh, or a choice needs to be made, your ultimate the conclusion of making the decision is understanding uh, as a believer what is in the will and the word of God. Uh, Jesus did it this way when he felt the blood sweating from his forehead in a place called Gethsemane. He said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Uh, but he had to remember why he was sent uh, so he could not rely on the blood sweating from his forehead to be the determining factor when he would leave the garden and go back to his home in Capernaum. He said, not my will, but thine will be done. Yes. Touch your neighbor and say, Jesus made a good choice. God wants us as a church to understand the authority of choosing the gospel. Gospel is defined as good news. And when I see a believer, when I see a Christian, I want to see somebody that knows something about good news. Somebody that knows the power and the authority of the gospel. And, and choosing the word of God as the lamp to their feet and the light unto their pathway. God, God's good news has the power to overcome a multitude of bad news. Anybody here know the story about the husband and wife when he walked into the living room? He said to her with a long face that something's wrong with the car. And she said, well, how do you know something's wrong with the car? And you don't know anything about working on cars. And he says, I think it's something wrong with the carburetor. She says, how do you know anything about carburetors? Do you never worked on a car a day in your life. And she says, how do you know it's the carburetor? He says, because the car is in the swimming pool. Sometimes we don't know how to convey bad news because all we know is bad news. We are so used to making bad decisions based on the decisions that were made by our parents and our parents' parents and, and people who are even affiliated with the church assuming that because they are in the church that they are capable of making good choices. But the only guide that we have in the 21st century by way of the Holy Spirit is the word of God to lead our hearts and minds to making good choices. Paul said the good that I would do even when I want to do it evil is present. He said that we also have to remember that we are all going to be just like that house that's not made not by hands. We have a building of God a house not made by hands eternal to God in the heaven. In other words, old folks had it right and they said there's a leak in this old building and my soul has got to move. So as we are living in this body, the enemy wants us to make a lifetime of bad choices. But when we are relying on God's word, we will let the spirit speak for us and we can make a good choice. The bad decisions of our past take on new meaning. We learn how to bind up our bad habits. 
Everybody here today has a bad habit or two. There's some things that people may know about that's a habit of yours. But then uh, there are those habitual secrets uh, that we have that we think nobody knows about. But we forget that God knows all and he sees all. Many people's habits are preventing them from reaching their full potential in God. Their habits are taken away from their stewardship potential in the church. Their habits are, are pulling away from their participation uh, in discipleship training. Their habits uh, are speaking for them uh, and speaking through them uh, when anger and frustration uh, begin to rise uh, in their being. Matthew 16 records a story of Peter confessing Jesus as the Christ the Son of God on the coast of Caesarea Philippi. At Caesarea Philippi, Simon Peter acknowledges that Jesus is the Messiah. Other people say that Jesus is just merely a prophet. Even one of the great prophets such as John the Baptist that has reappeared. But Peter believes that Jesus is the one of the prophets foretold. That he is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He is the root of Jesse. He is the stone that's hewn out of the mountain and has become the cornerstone. He is the Messiah. God's anointed king and Peter has may have had a high opinion of Jesus but Jesus is also has a great praise for him. Wait a minute, many people have heard the cliche when praises go up blessings will come down. He tells Simon how fortunate he is because only God could have revealed to this wonderful secret unto him. Now, Bible scholars call it the messianic secret. This is Jesus' reluctance to reveal his true identity for fear of an uprising in the land of Israel. Jesus would build his church on Peter's faith. Many people thought he was talking about Peter because Peter's name is translated the rock. But he could not build it on Peter because Peter died. But Peter's faith still lives on through the life and the witness of the church. Touch your neighbor and say, make a choice. The Peter whose name means rock is the foundation of the stone of Jesus' new community. The community will live forever because it will invade and break open the gates of death and hell. Peter will have a central control in the early church by waking the ways of heaven known on earth. So if somebody you know is going through hell, you have the authority to bind up something. When the devil is on my trail, when the devil is on my sidewalk, when the devil is at my doorstep, God gave me the power to bind that devil. Because he said to Peter, he said to Peter, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And I've been uh, on this journey for a little while now. Uh, and I will be remiss if I let a devil show up out of nowhere uh, and take back everything uh, that God has already given to me. Touch uh, your neighbor and say, bind you. Somebody has a question today that even though we as believers will have to suffer, even though we will be tested and tried, uh, we do have the authority to choose uh, to do the will of God, which will give us the power to overcome the enemy. How do we bind it, preacher? The first lesson is in our text. Uh, the first lesson is, is watch what people say. Yes. Just today we say, watch what people say. Old folks used to tell us, watch the company we keep. But also we have to watch who has our ear. And some of us around here, we'll listen to anybody. Somebody can tell us something that it can be just as wrong as two left feet. But because of who that person is, we'll believe everything they say. So Jesus knew how fickle people were. He knew how we have the capacity and the, and the tendency to listen to almost anybody. And when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples because he knew they were impressed. But he said, who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus was taking a survey. If you watch the CNN 
poll, if you watch Fox News, depending on the philosophical perception of the one that is doing the presenting, uh, different sides of the same story will be presented. Uh, on Fox News, Obama will have a 42% approval rating, and on uh, CNN, he'll have another number. But it does not matter what the people think about the job that the president is doing. Should he go uh, to Israel? Should he go to the first of Missouri? It does not matter about the opinions of the people. What really matters is the opinion of the people that really are supporting yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, do I have your support? See, those of us who are listening to people who do not support us are what the Bible calls a fool. You don't need to listen to people who don't have your best interest at home. Don't need to listen to people who don't even have enough courage to get on their knees and pray about your situation. You don't need to listen to people who don't have the breath of the Lord and the praise of the Lord on their lips because Jesus said, if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. And I'm watching. I don't know about you, but I'm watching in the midst of believers to listen to what people are saying. I'm listening to see who has the praise of God on their lips. What Jesus found out in the preliminary version of his survey is that it's a psalm say. You ever heard people say it? They say it. You need to ask that question. Well, who is that? Well, that, well that's, that, I don't know whether it's true or not, but that's what I heard. People have uh, the tendency to listen to almost anybody, and almost anybody has their ear. When anybody has your ear, your reasoning is not authoritative because it does not fall in line with the word of God. Jesus was not John the Baptist because John the Baptist had been beheaded. Jesus was not Elijah because Elijah had ascended into the skies in a chariot. Jesus was not Jeremiah because Jeremiah was put into the stocks as the book of Kings recorded and he was later killed. But you, Jesus says, that's who I'm really concerned about. Who do you say that I am? My brothers and sisters, this is where the transition began to take place in terms of being just part of the crowd. Because many people in Christianity really just want to be a part of the crowd. All the crowd really wants to do is to see Jesus. The crowd just wants to hear what he has to say. The crowd really has no intentions of going after him one way or the other. They just want to be able to say that they saw the man that many said was the Son of God. And what Jesus is doing was testing the commitment of the disciples to make sure that their thinking was not the same as the crowds. And you need to make sure that you don't have that windy mentality where whatever way the wind is blowing, that's the way your mind is thinking. You need to make sure that you go out and find out for yourself about what's really going on before you listen to Sally, Jane, and Junebug at the barbershop to make your conclusion. Read it for yourself. Learn it for yourself. Get on your knees and pray and watch what people say. Secondly, we have to worship Christ only. So today we say worship Christ only. Many people who have yet to give up their ears to being in the crowds have yet to yield their hearts to Christ the King. This is where Peter made the transition. He made a transition from the crowds to being uh, the core leader of the church when he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now let me take my time here to explain clearly what Peter is really saying. And when he is saying that he is the son of the living God, God is not a mausoleum. God is not a cemetery. God is not in a museum somewhere to be treated as an heirloom or an idol in which we give homage to and then return to our mundane, rudimentary experience. What Peter is saying clearly to us is, is that Jesus is the Christ. He's not just Jesus, because when he's just Jesus, all we're looking for is fish and bread. When he's Jesus, all we're looking for is water turning to wine. When he's just 
Jesus, we are looking for miracles. But when he is Christ, we can get down on our knees and say glory to God in the house. This is when a transition, touch your name and say a transition. This is when a transition is made in your doctrine, your theology, and also your psychology. Is that when you are hearing from others uh, that things are going on and they are worse than they actually are, we begin to conclude to the fact that more prayer is needed, uh, more time in the presence of God is needed uh, in order to see things from God's perspective. Uh, our world has been in trouble before. We've gone through two world wars, 9 11. We've gone through uh, racial hatred and segregation in this country, but yet many times when trouble rises in our world today, people believe that the world is coming to an end. All God is saying is, is that we need to stay on our knees so that we can see Christ only and see Christ always. Many people are worshiping other things that are taking away from their decision making. It's, it's, it's always about somebody else's agenda. It's always about something that has nothing to do with the will of God and the word of God. And so Jesus was moved by Peter's profession. In his profession, he was not recognizing Jesus just as a savior because in the last chapter when Peter began to sink, he said, Lord, save me. And God brought him up out of the muck and the miry waters. In this chapter, when he says, thou art the Christ, he was saying that he was who God said that he was. He was the one that God had sent to, to take away the sins of the world. He was the one uh, that was worthy of the praise. Yes, thank you. It's a big challenge for us to put our priorities in order. Many days, many times we're running from here to there going after this thing and that thing, never actually pausing and reflecting on our own worship experience, actually taking the time to look at ourselves and look out of ourselves to see how we're being used as an instrument for the Almighty God. All right. Peter was rewarded in the next few verses, and he was also given instructions of how to carry out the process of sharing the gospel. Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Not only do you watch what people say, not only do you worship Christ only, but thirdly, you got to walk in authority. Right. Touch your neighbor say, walk in authority. Look at what he gives them in verse 19. I'm so happy about it. He says, I will give you the keys. And whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth is already loose in heaven. I love God because God always has two sanctuaries. He has a sanctuary that we're in in the worship experience, but he also has a building that's not made by hands. I'm so glad that I am duly blessed because when I'm duly blessed, I got the blessings that you can see, but I'm also living off of blessings that you cannot see. That means that when God spoke to me, you weren't there when he told me that I can walk in authority. That means when God spoke to me. You may not have been there when he says I can live without apology. Now the clerk say it's not wrong here. I belong here. So you might as well get used to me. Just the neighbor say I'm walking in it. When you're willing to find something, what it means is, is you're binding it all together. This is just like those who were harvesting. When it was time for the harvest, they began to grab all the sheaves together. Together, and they would wrap all the sheaves up and they would bind them because the sheaves were ready for the harvest. But the word bind also comes to the word to imprison or to put in chains. So that means that some of us, now that we have been given the authority, we have authority to put down Jack Daniels. We have the authority to put down the Newport. We have the authority to put down the remote control. We have the authority to put down Wendy's and Burger King. 
king. We can bind it all because we have the power to choose. Is there anybody here today that is just like what the Bible says? That I won't be halted between two opinions. I know who God is and I know who God has. And God's got it all in the palm of his hand. Binding and loosing implies that applying God's word to the people of God. In verse 8, chapter 18, verse 18, this is use of the church discipline and the power that is given to all of the disciples, not just Peter alone. So in other words, when Jesus said, on this rock, he was not talking about Peter because Peter died. As the church history tells us, Peter was hung on a cross upside down because he didn't want to die in the same way that his Savior died. Many people feel that in those who have the office of Peter, that they have the power to bind. But it's not bound to the person. It's not even bound to the office. It's bound to whoever has faith in Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here that knows that they got the power to choose? You can say, for God I live and for God I die. It doesn't matter what your neighbor is doing. You got the power to praise him anyway in spite of your neighbor's frown. Is anybody here that's got a praise on the inside that they can't keep to themselves and they know like they know that they know that God is still on the throne. That Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. Is there anybody here that knows who picked them up and turned them around and placed their speech on solid ground? If that person is you, get on your feet today. Tell your testimony and say, I was bound. I was kept down for so long. But Jesus stepped in right on. He lives so I can find it. He lives so I can put it under my feet. He lives. Say yeah. Say yeah. Because when you bind it, that's when you truly are walking in authority. Let us stand to our feet.